Hello and welcome my partners in crime. Welcome back to Murder Analyze for another true crime case. Now, today's case is an unsolved case. It's, uh, it's been said, it's still an open case. All right, it's an open case, but it's the oldest, I think it's been sort of said that it's one of, or not the oldest, open cases on the disappearance with the Met, uh, Metropolitan Police. So it's an interesting case because on the, on, on the surface, it looks like this girl's just got up and gone, gone missing. But there is other things at play here. So anyway, this case is Mary Flanagan case, the disappearance of Mary Flanagan. Now, she was 16, actually, at the time of her disappearance. And she disappeared on the 31st of December, 1959. So it's a very old, historic case. But even so, it's a case I still think that needs to be put out there because someone may know something. They may do. They may do. Because I always say, don't I, that there is always someone that knows something and we just need that person to come forward with some information. And I will say, don't I, whether you think it's uh, important information or trivial piece of information, it's information. And sometimes that small bit of information that you think is so trivial it's not worth saying it's a jigsaw piece, isn't it, that fits into that whole network of other um, bits of evidence that they may have on, on, on this case. So it's really important, no matter how little you know about something or whether you just have a feeling that you knew something or you, your mum had said something to you, your dad had said something to you, your nan had said something to you, because it's a very old case. It's important that you come forward with this information and to really just to help solve this case really is important. So let's get on with it. So Mary, of course, you know, Flanagan was, um, lives in London. She was born in London. She was born the 9th of June, 1943. And her Catholic family plus from Irish descent. So she was like London Irish. And that, but really, really, you know, good family. She had two sisters, uh, Ellen and Brenda and a brother, Kevin. So she came from a lovely family. The family lived in Wallace Road, East 15. Now listen, I have put a map up, but Wallace Road no longer exists, not in, um, you know, in, in that part. There is a Wallace Road in London, of course there is, but it's not the Wallace Road. That's now gone and it's changed and, and stuff. As, you know, developments in London change, um, Wallace Road is no longer there where she used to live. Uh, there's just not. Her fa father was, um, I think, lived, I think he came from uh, County Meath, um, and, uh, lovely part, actually, Meath. Anyway, she, uh, and the mother was called Mary as well, so she was named after her mum. And that, and they all lived, um, you know, in this Wallace Road. And, you know, I think we have to look back on London in this case, because in 1959, London was a different place to what it is today. You know, it, it was, um, you know, and also 16 year olds are a lot different than what they are today. She was, had a couple of jobs. She had already left school. You probably left school at 15 or 14, nine months, 15, nine months, she had left school. In them days was when you could actually leave school and walk out into a factory and get a job the next day. Because at that time, in in especially in, in this environment you needed the money you know everyone was working um university and stuff yeah it was on the cards but not for everybody it's not like it is today you could go and think oh i'm gonna go to college and we'll go to uni you know no you left school the next day you're in a job and mary actually had two jobs and we'll come to one of her jobs in a minute now one of the jobs you know, I've got a picture, I love it, and, uh, you know, the Sugar Girls. Now, she worked, Mary worked, in this, um, oh gosh, what's it called, uh, Tate and Lyle Sugar Company, and that was in Silvertown. And she also worked in an uh, opticians in Stratford, and was also volunteered with the Blind Association. Now, listen, you can see what I mean about this girl, 16 year old, two jobs, helping out with the Blind Association as well. Very, very nice young girl. You know, uh, 
on the surface she had these jobs so anyway I think before we go on any further about her works especially in the sugar factory we need to sort of have a look at this disappearance so a member of her family was disgusted with her disappearance in 2013 suggested that Flanagan may have eloped with a man um, that she had been seen with frequently in the last few weeks of 1959 so she'd met him a few don't forget she went missing New Year's Eve 1959 31st of December so a few weeks before that she had met this this man and he was meant to be also supposedly of Irish descent he was um, it was said he may work for the or may have worked for them within the merchant navy but it was also said that he could have been a labourer and I think it was her dad Mary's dad that introduced this man Tom so called Tom uh, to his daughter and he was in his um, 20s at the time so this Tom, or Tom McGinty, they think that was his name, McGinty. It could have been uh, McGuinness, McEntry. Now, the police had, I'll tell you this now, had asked the Royal Navy if they had any Tom McGinty or any name like that and described as best. No, they couldn't find any record of, of um, that name or similar names that had been serving in the Navy at around that time or just before that time. So they did check that out. I think the thing is with um, when she was 16 and seeing this man and, and you know, the dad had just met him probably, you know, I don't, yeah, there was no, I think the dad didn't know him really well, but he just met him and from there they met. They built this association. She was a very pretty girl, 16 year old girl, probably easily influenced as well by this man he was meant to have quite a good character and stuff like that and there was meant to be it was suggested that he could have been her fiance now they'd only met for a little while and it has been said by other people including her family that she may have been pregnant by this man and in them days you know having a baby out of wedlock wouldn't have gone down really well especially coming from you know a Catholic background you know Irish descent this wouldn't have gone around so they would have thought you know it's best to get married and that whether you know <laughs> that's in them days what was going on wasn't it if you you know you was um, whether you was happy with someone or not if you became pregnant really because there was no benefit system in them days for single parents Right, the mother and the father would have had to have brought this child up. There's a lot that goes in to having a child in 1959, um, which is not like today at all. So as I said, we look at London in a little bit wider areas, and I'll probably do that with photographs and stuff, to show you how people lived in them days. It's certainly not the same as it was today. So if Mary, by any reason, had become pregnant by this man, uh, her family said that she would have been really worried about that plus so she would have um, felt a lot of stigma and she may have felt that she had to leave um, her home and her family through the shame of that um, do I think that's the case here? no no I don't not at all but we're going to this a little bit further the night before so we're talking about the 30th of December 1959 of Mary's disappearance. There was a sort of a row and she had end up, I think there was a row I think between this Tom and the dad and her, also between her and this Tom. And she had told her sister, or the sister believes sort of as she overheard, because she's a lot younger than her, overheard sort of things and that Mary couldn't sleep that night. She would said that she had had enough and, and that this Tom had meant to be living in rooms or you know boarding houses which was normal in them days but it turned out he was living with his mother or so he told her and there was I think Mary maybe even at 16 began to realize something more was going on with this man than what she knew and so she couldn't sleep and the next night she was meant to be going out to this New Year's Eve party at the Tate and Lyle Sugar Company. And that was it. 
she had got up the next day, you know, she had told, you know, and it was mentioned that she was going to finish with this man and everything else. And uh, she said goodbye to her mum and kissed her mum goodbye and off she went. And that was the last time that her parents or her family have seen her. So on the 31st of December, 1959, that was it. Nothing. Nothing from this, this poor family. Nothing. So as far as her family knew and everyone else was concerned, she was meant to be attending this, you know, New Year's Eve party. And this was uh, this was annually, you know, God, years ago, everyone, didn't they? All the big companies used to have them, you know, these Christmas parties, I used to love it. But anyway, um, especially in them days, anything for a party, you know, and the firms were really good in them days. They used to really support, you know, their workers and, and gave and stuff, especially this uh, Silvertown plant where she worked. And um, so she was last seen actually approaching West Ham Tube Station and that was it and that was by someone. But listen, even in London, even today and even in 1959, a tube in London take you anywhere. You get on the tube, that's it, you go anywhere can't you? But she was approaching it so we don't actually know if she made it to the tube but she was approaching the tube station. If she had got on that tube she could have gone anywhere but she certainly didn't go to the Christmas party. Now when the police then was looking into this sort of case, it was stated by the company, well actually we didn't think she was going to attend the annual party because she hadn't been in. So she'd been telling her parents that she was going to work at the sugar factory. But actually she wasn't. She hadn't been going there. So one of the questions is, I suppose, where had she been going? She hadn't gone to work, so she was lying to her parents for days, pretending to go to work, but not turning up. So where had she been going? Had it been this Tom? Had it been somebody else? We don't know. But the, the actual employers, that employer, did not expect her to be at the annual party anyway. So I don't think if she was getting on a tube, it wasn't to go to this party. It may have been to go to another party or somewhere else, but it wasn't to go to this one. So this is what I'm saying. When you actually look at this case in a little bit more depth, there's more to Mary than meets the eye, isn't there? Because people in the 1950s at 16, this girl had two jobs working for the blind. She was an adult, really, in her mind. She knew. You know, she was brought up in London, brought up in West Ham. She knew all around this area. She knew what trains to get on, you know, the underground. She used it. She used it. Like everyone else today in London, you're brought up in London. It's not a place that's going to affect you in a way you think, oh, I won't go there, I won't go there. They're brought up with it. They understand it. They live it. You know, part of the tubes and all this is just part of their life, isn't it? It's part of life. So where did she go? Where did she go? Because she certainly never returned. That was it. So that actually, to this day, that is the last sighting from anybody to do with Mary Flanagan. Was see her, seeing her approaching the West Ham tube station. That was it. Never been seen or heard of until this day. Now in 2013, right, don't forget this is an old case uh, and I know the records were destroyed and we'll go into that in a little while longer, a little bit longer. While we can't then look at the investigation but it, you see it's in 1959 at 16 year old they just thought she'd run away. She'd gone off met someone, she's off, she'll turn up. You know, we, they weren't investigating like we would today. They just wasn't. Because in them days, we didn't hear of it, did we? Not really. It wasn't something that's shoved in our faces every day. You know, now I can do missing persons all day long from London, all day long. Some people are just never found, but they, in 1959, the police had limited resources 
Plus, this case wasn't taken seriously at first because they believed that she's a working woman. She understands life, as I've said. She understands London, how it works. If she wanted to go, she could have gone, and she did. It wasn't until a few years later on down the line that things started to change. Yes, they'd post us up and things that they could do in them days, but no one was coming forward with any information because no one seemed to know anything. And this man, Tom, has certainly never at any point told, has come forward and said anything about this. But because their records were destroyed in a flood that happened at the police station, it's very difficult then to go over anything that the police may have had, any statements they may have had at the time, because they were destroyed. You know, water destroys a lot of stuff. And so any leads now that in 2013 they could have looked at because they would have had the cold case files out, there weren't any. There weren't any. So in this case, we are back to zero. But in 2013, there were things we could do, wasn't there? You can check national insurance databases. And in 1983, um, from and, and you know subsequent years, they continue to check all these sort of databases for stuff. Uh, this had never her national insurance number had never been used. So if you if you saying that your national insurance and that's how you had to get employment, right? You need to show your employment. Maybe not um, everywhere, right? Everywhere, but really, um, somewhere along the line, her national insurance would have come up if at any point from the day she went missing, any point through there that she had had some form of employment, legal employment, um, it would have come up. But it's not necessarily saying that if she was in Australia or you know somewhere else and and stuff and started again which has happened, you know, it, that, it, it would not. But if she was here and they've checked it, um, you know, this girl was from London, right? She's a Londoner. So it's, you know, it's, I, I don't know why it wouldn't have come up. And that is one of the reasons why I think um, it's something, you know, sinister happened to Mary. I don't believe that she just ran off and met someone. There's too much... Um, stuff that doesn't add up, definitely, you know, with this Tom, his unknown name, his unknown status, all these different things, she didn't know him very well, where was she going, why wasn't she telling her parents where she was going, lots of different things going on, and then to, you know, 2003, uh, 2013, that you know then that there is no national insurance being used or anything, it, it, it's not hopeful for this case. But anyway, I think um, uh, Metro Home Police and local missing um, unit in Newham, now they done the uh, photo of um, her. And it's, um, you know, when you look at it, as this is when she would have been 74. I mean, now she'd be like 80 something or 80. But this is when she was 74. So they've done the age progression photograph of her. And you see the two sisters, can't you, sitting there holding holding this uh, photo of her when she was young and then you see her as this old woman. I mean, they've said, the sisters, that their dad had no life after Mary went or disappeared. He continued to search daily in the evenings and go around the local pubs or any dance halls or anything. He couldn't rest. He couldn't rest. He needed to find his daughter and he couldn't find her. But he looked. And they say that their childhood was affected by this. Of course it would be. Not that they blame him because they feel the same way. They need to know what happened to their sister. A sister that was loved and cared for. She had a life in front of her, didn't she? 16 year old. See, so near West Ham tube station and you're gone. So this father and mother, up until the day they died, never stopped searching for Mary. And now the sisters, and this was, um, I think, 2017, have continued and continued and continued to try and get this case out there. Because really all they want, you know, is to know 
one way or the other what happened to Mary before they die. Because these are old women now. They've lived their whole life with this. Their whole life. And as I always say, there's always more than one victim in these sort of cases. It's a not knowing, isn't it? It's the secondary victims as well that struggle to get through life, that can't get on, can't move on, like the mum and dad couldn't move on. So if you know anything about what happened to Mary Flanagan, please call the numbers that I've listed below. As I said, any information is better than nothing. You may not think it's relevant. Your grandmother might have said something, your granddad, your auntie, your uncle, your sister, your brother. If you say something and it's not right, it's not right. But if you know anything, please contact any of these people that I've wrote on here just to try and make this case now final one way or the other. So thank you for joining me for this case. Um, it's an interesting case. But just because it's a 1959 case doesn't make it relevant. They're all relevant because they're all human beings and we all need to know what happened. So you know what to do. You can follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can catch us up on Spotify. You can subscribe to any time you would like. You can leave me some messages. It would be great. So until the next time, bye-bye.